sort of a little bit of an overview on what this is looking like. And I put together a little bit of a diagram here just to give us a high level overview, a little bit of an understanding on where we're at as it relates to the impeachment proceedings. Okay, so right now we are in a trial. The trial is taking place in the Senate. Donald Trump has already been impeached as a result of what took place in the House of Representatives back in January, right after the Capitol Hill riots took place. And so today we were only having conversations in the Senate about jurisdiction. Okay, that's it. That's all that the rules said. And I want to show you what the rules said specifically. This is the resolution. And this is saying that it's Mr. Schumer and Mr. McConnell, they submitted their resolution. And this was to provide for related procedures concerning the article of impeachment for Donald Trump. And we're not going to go through this whole document, but I just wanted to show you what was scheduled for today. So today, Tuesday, February 9th, there shall be four hours of argument by the parties equally divided on the question of whether Donald Trump is subject to the jurisdiction of a court of impeachment for acts committed while president, notwithstanding the expiration of his term of office. So can he still be impeached? Can he still be tried even though he's not in office anymore? That's what we were trying to discuss today. Each side may determine the number of persons to present argument for the foregoing questions without any intervening action, except for deliberation. They're going to go and move forward. They're going to have, they're going to be able to vote. Basically, it's going to just be a quorum. If, the, if, it's, if it's a majority vote, then they can move forward. And it's going to say they, they're going to decide by, you know, yeas, or, yeas and nays. If they vote in the negative, meaning if they vote that there's nothing constitutional about this, they're going to dismiss the case. And if it is approved, then it is going to move forward. And we already know, if you have been following the news, it's been approved. It's, I think it was 56 to 40 something. I'm going to show you that slide here in a minute. But those are the rules. We're just talking about jurisdiction. So what I did is I put together a little bit of a flow chart on, for example, how I would be handling this case if I were a prosecutor. If this were a real court of law, if we could talk about you know, some civil law elements, some criminal law elements, some political elements, if we could cram all of that into one proceeding, which is kind of what this is in the impeachment proceeding that took place today, this is how I would do it. Now, if you've been a regular of the channel, you know that largely I've been pretty sympathetic to Donald Trump's defense here because I just don't think that his conduct on January 6th or even preceding that, that it amounted to insurrection, that it was an incitement of insurrection. I've said that it's reckless. I said that I don't necessarily agree with a lot of what he has said out there or how he framed it or phrased it. But is it criminal? Is it a high crime or misdemeanor? Is it something that warrants impeachment? I, I just haven't seen legally how that works, how you can get there. And I'm a criminal defense attorney, so I like to take hard cases. I like to defend people. That's just my instinct. I don't like the government prosecuting anybody, whether it's a, you know, a, a single mom who is being charged with a license plate violation or whether it is somebody who is the, the former president of the United States. I want the government to, to prove their cases. They don't just get to say something bad happened and we're angry about it, so we got to charge somebody with a crime. They got to prove it, and they got to go through the motions in order to do that. And I just have not seen that here for the impeachment proceedings. And I know a lot of people disagree with me, but if I were a prosecutor, this is what I would do. And let me show you this flow chart. It's not something that is the only way to do it. It's not something that is the right way or the wrong way. It's just one way to do it. And I just I'm using this for illustration, for illustrative purposes only. Feel free to disagree with it. Here is what the flow chart looks like. And so what I want to do is, is run you through this. This is generally how, you know, loosely how a criminal case would work or how an impeachment proceeding, in my opinion, should work. That's not what we saw at all today. So let's run through this. We're going to start up top here. What you need, of course, is a bad event, right? Over here, this first box, this is going to be a bad event. And it's going to be, of course, the Capitol Hill protest, or you could really define this however you want. Put whatever you want in there, the riots. You could call it Trump's speech, whatever it is. Then you're going to need to establish jurisdiction. So the court has to be able to hear the case, right? If you get charged with a DUI in the state of Texas, Texas has to hear the case. You can't go to California because California doesn't have jurisdiction over the underlying charge. Courts have different jurisdictions, right? You don't, you don't file a DUI case in the United States Supreme Court. They don't have any jurisdiction over it. Right? Unless there's an appealable issue and they grant a writ of certiorari and all that stuff. But largely that happens at a lower level state court. So we were just talking about jurisdiction today and specifically about whether the Constitution permits this to move forward, whether the article of impeachment was severable, 
whether there were any procedural problems that the, the, the Republicans could use to throw some of this stuff out and so on. And this is where we were supposed to just hang out. We were supposed to spend a lot of time only talking about jurisdiction because this is a threshold issue. You can't move forward. You can't talk about incitement or insurrection or interference or anything unless the court has jurisdiction. And we know that they do have jurisdiction. They just voted that way. So we know that we're moving forward tomorrow into this other stuff. But today was only supposed to be about the jurisdiction. Now, what you'll notice is we didn't really spend much time talking about that, at least from some of the, 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 the commentary that we heard from some of the Democrats today. Uh, I heard uh, uh, Raskin, the U.S. House representative, the impeachment manager, talk a lot about how much harm there was. We, I think we had a 17-minute video or something of uh, all the damage that was occurring around the Capitol building. All the harm. Raskin gave this very emotional plea where he was specifically saying, I, we just buried my son. You know, my daughter was there at the Capitol and we were scared to death. I heard pounding on the doors. Very emotional statement. And I have a lot of empathy for the man. He sounds very, very fearful. His daughter was very fearful. And it's not something that I would want anybody in this country to experience. But that's... That's just that, right? What does that have to do with anything else here? What does that have to do with incitement, causation, insurrection, or any of these other things? Basically, what he was talking about was not jurisdiction. He was talking about the interference. He was saying there was a lot of interference. There was a lot of problems going on that, that he recounted with his daughter and all of that stuff. But he kind of skipped over these other boxes, which, again, I'm going to run through here briefly. So we spent a lot of time talking about sort of the verdict that Donald Trump should be guilty because of there was interference. And we, we kind of skipped over things like causation, whether there was actually insurrection taking place or whether there was incitement. And so I understand what's happening here. Okay, I understand that this is a political spectacle that both sides are trying to just make frothy emotional appeals. Largely, the Democrats did that today. They want to rile you up. They want to bring out uh, sort of the, the worst emotional experiences that they had so that you feel it, so that you also will associate those bad feelings with Donald Trump. And this happens a lot in criminal law. And it's not particularly ethical, in my opinion. What happens all the time is if the prosecution in a criminal trial has a bad, bad case, let's say they've got a murder a defendant, somebody's on trial for murder, the prosecution, they can't really prove that he did it, but they have a lot of, of victims, right? They have a dead guy, they have his wife, daughter, spouse, husband, brother, sisters, employers, everybody, and they just parade them into court and it's sympathy statement after sympathy statement, your honor, don't do this, don't do this, right? It's in, in the course of trial. And they're just parading all of these people in front of the court. And you, you as a defendant, you're going, OK, well, that's great. Uh, you know, we're sorry for your loss. We're sorry that he's not around anymore. I'm, I'm very, you know, regretful that he's not here. And it sounds like mom, you're hurting dad, you too, brother, you too, sister, witness, all these other people who know that this person is dead and their lives are over because of it. We, we get it right? Awful situation. But what does that have to do with anything connecting my client to that death? They still got to prove that he was there, that he caused it, that he didn't cause it out of self-defense, that there was no other supervening cause or intervening cause. Or there's, a, there's a lot of other things that they have to prove. You can't just bring in a bunch of people that have been harmed by something and just sort of loosely tie that to the original charge. I know it might feel like that's okay. You might be able to say, well, this is really traumatic. I mean, this is the Capitol building. Oh, my goodness. This is a threat to America because of what we saw happen there. Yeah, it was egregious. It was gross. But... Did Donald Trump cause that? Did, did his speech incite it? That's what they got to prove. And they skipped most of that today. They just kind of jumped right into it. We, had, we do have a clip from John, uh, Joe over from Colorado, a representative, who, uh, who talked a little bit about it and, and mentioned Jonathan Turley. And we're going to get into all of it. But we just want to be very clear about where we're at in this process. Because you have to go through uh, you know, formal due process. Typically, this isn't, this isn't a regular criminal trial. But it should resemble a criminal trial. It should resemble some sort of due process that you would see in a regular court of law because Donald Trump is on trial for committing high crimes and misdemeanors, one of which happens to be the incitement of insurrection. All right, so let me run you through how I would break this down if I were a prosecutor. Okay, now, if I am the prosecutor, of course, we're going to get past the jurisdictional hurdle. We have to show that it's constitutional, that there is no severability issues, and that the procedurally, it's, it's, all, it's all okay. 
right? And they basically did that today. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on that. But once you get there, then you also have to prove incitement, okay? And incitement means something. It's not just that you said some bad words. It's about you knowingly said something that was intended to do something and then something happened, right? And there's some standards that we've talked about. So if you're a prosecutor, you got to identify it. What's the language? What did he say? And what was the resulting cause what happened like what was the harm that came as a result of that and so that's incitement now they tried to do that in their article of impeachment in a four-page document that was largely a joke we've made a joke about it we talked about the impeachment party i wrote templates to show you how easy it is to just fill in that that basically blank form and impeach anybody you want for incitement it's a very low standard that they set because they referenced two statements in that article from trump's speech that's it just two quotes and they were both very benign if you read them in context, which we did on this show. So very, very benign stuff. They went forward on it anyways. Then when they realized that the, the underlying article was so sort of facially deficient, they beefed it up with an 80 plus page memorandum that uh, sort of brought in a lot of other stuff. They brought in, they expanded the scope of the inquiry. Now they're talking about, well, just not those two statements in Donald Trump's speech, but they're also talking about what Rudy said and what Don Jr. said and what Sidney Powell said and what Lynn Wood said. And you go, wait a minute. I thought Donald Trump incited this. Now you're saying that everybody else is responsible for it. All right. So they're modifying their argument a little bit. But you also have to consider what some of the defenses are. So let's break this down again. You have to have incitement of something. OK, incitement by itself is is something that leads to some other action. Yesterday, we talked about the Brandenburg test. And on this, this uh, flow chart, in red, these are the defenses. So if you're Donald Trump's defense teams, uh, you would bring this up in response to this. So if the prosecutor is saying, okay, we have enough here to prove incitement, Donald Trump and his team could just simply respond and they could say, well, eh, that actually doesn't fall within incitement because the U.S. Supreme Court has said that you can follow the Brandenburg test, which says you have to be likely to incite something and it did incite and you're using the reasonable person standard. If that all is OK, if that all happens, then this this Brandenburg defense will fail. But if it's not, if it doesn't meet all of those elements, then this is an absolute defense to the incitement charge, right? There, there is no incitement. Therefore, there's no insurrection and the whole thing goes away, right? And so Donald Trump would use the Brandenburg defense. And I didn't hear any of that today, which we shouldn't because we're still talking about jurisdiction. But are we going to hear that tomorrow and Thursday? I don't know. So once again, incitement. What are you inciting? We went through some of the Brandenburg stuff yesterday, the U.S. Supreme Court, when we were talking about the KKK member who was out there saying, we're going to take to the streets. And he made some veiled threats. They said, that's not enough. Okay. That's not incitement. You want people in this country to be able to get out there and speak vocally. The Supreme Court has even said things like if you go on Cornell's website and look up the Brandenburg test, then you'll see what it says. And it will, it will tell you very clearly that the Supreme Court favors the side of free speech, especially political speech. If you're out there being vocal, that's political speech. That's protected, especially if it's in the context of an election, which is exactly, excuse me, what Donald Trump was doing. So the Brandenburg test is a defense. Now, incitement can be other things, right? In this claim, they're talking about the incitement of an insurrection. But you could also incite other things. You could incite a riot, right? You could incite a murder. You could incite, uh, you know, manslaughter. You could incite, uh, you know, public disorder by screaming fire in a crowded theater. You can incite a lot of things, but you got to incite something else. So the first thing that they would have to do is say, well, Donald Trump, he was responsible for the incitement. But what did he incite? And that's where as a prosecutor, you'd come back and you'd say, well, it was pretty clear, right? It was an insurrection. And we defined insurrection on this show. And I actually was, was uh, you know, I kind of adopted the looser definition of that, where I think arguably you could make the claim that what happened was an insurrection. Very brief. It was like three hours, maybe. But yeah, they were interfering with the government operation. They were interfering with the counting of the electoral votes. And that was a big problem, right? That's insurrection. So Donald Trump incited the insurrection, just like you could incite a riot. This was insurrection because it involved the U.S. government. If he was inciting a riot at, at a Walmart, well, then this element doesn't get met, right? Because there's no insurrection there. It has to be interfering with the government. And so as a prosecutor, what would you do? You'd say, well, Donald Trump had the mens rea. He had the mental state. He had a guilty mental state. He wanted this to happen. He was intending for the electoral vote count to be disturbed. 
And I think you could make an argument for that, which they're probably going to do tomorrow. You could go back all of his prior statements and say, yeah, kind of a kind of a pattern here. Right now, that is not in the article of impeachment. So it's sort of after the fact they expanded the scope of this thing. But you could make that claim. I don't think that he intended there at all. Personally, I don't I don't I don't think that you can glean from his speech that he was intending that the Capitol building be stormed. But I can see the argument. And then you have to have what's called an actus reus, which is a physical act, right? This is an act in furtherance of the offense. So you've got a, a guilty mind and you've got a guilty act. So you've, you're not only are you thinking about a crime, but you're also moving the ball forward to commit the crime. And so if they can prove that, and they would say, well, his speech that directly came from incitement is enough, right? And that's, where, that's, that's, that's how they would define that term. And so they would say, okay, we have jurisdiction. We also have incitement because it fails a Brandenburg test and they interfered with the government. So now that's going to be an insurrection right now. Donald Trump, his, his automatic defense is going to be that's political speech. I'm allowed to say it. OK, I'm allowed to get out there and talk about this stuff. And I think he's right. If the Supreme Court, if you read some of their case law on First Amendment, especially political speech, it is the most it's highly protected, highly, highly protected. It's basically the, one of the main reasons we have free speech. So that you can be vocal and even volatile about politics. Now, you may disagree with it politically, but if you have a problem with an election, if you think that an election was fraudulently conducted, don't you want to be able to speak out about that? Don't you have to be able to speak out about it? And how do you do that in a way that isn't volatile? Okay, Trump is a show person. There's no question about it. I think you could, you know, he could have easily uh, tampered down his language. He could have said, well, you know, I think that this was um, an election that was not legitimate because of the irregularities that I saw. But he doesn't talk like that. He says this thing was stolen. They ripped it out from under us. That's political speech. It's it's not well advised in, in hindsight in 2020. But... Is it not protected? I think that it is. And I think the Supreme Court would agree with that. So here you've got Donald Trump raising a defense of political speech, insurrection, political speech. That's his defense. Now, if the Democrats can overcome that, which they have tried to do, they've said that, well, it's not it's not protected under the First Amendment. We can still move forward with an impeachment, which they're going to continue to do. Then they can just say, well, this defense doesn't count either. OK, so now they have to move on. They got to show causation. So not only does the court have jurisdiction, not only did Donald Trump say something that led to something else called insurrection, but the but all of that was the cause of the interference. OK, because if you have incitement, but somebody else caused the, the ultimate in interference. Well, then that's that's a not guilty for Donald Trump. So causation means that they can tie this incitement directly to the interference. So there's there's a there's a, a breach of conduct here that was directly caused by Donald Trump that resulted in the governmental interference. Donald Trump's defense would be I didn't I didn't cause that. And I wrote down here intervening or superseding causes. Donald Trump can say no, I was giving a speech. Something else set them off. Something else released them. I was speaking. They were walking towards the Capitol before I was even done with my speech. Something was intervening. Some external cause. Or, or is it an entirely different cause, right? It could have been Q. It could have been, you know, it could have been any other politician. It could have been third parties that are organizing militias around the country that were just upset that Joe Biden won. Just in general, right? I mean, there's a million different people or a, a different organizations that, well, not a million, but you get my point. There's a lot of other organizations that are in, highly involved in, in this. Okay, we've had the Oath Keepers, you have the Proud Boys, we've had BLM people who were there, and on and on and on. So was anybody else the underlying cause? Did somebody else step in? What else triggered it? That would be Donald Trump's defense. I didn't cause it. It happened. Yeah, it was really bad. It happened, but I didn't do it. People were upset. CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, anybody else, right? That would be their defense. Then you'll also run into interference. 
Now they got to show that. What was the interference here? Pretty clear, pretty obvious. This is easy to prove. This one is not even, I don't know, you can't, can't even argue with this. There was 100% interference. Congress could not count the votes. They got interrupted for three or four hours. They were back. They finished it. But there was interference. Now, I wrote also negligence. Negligence is sort of a causation uh, uh, argument here, but I also wanted to sort of bring this up. Negligence. So if Donald Trump says, if, if they say, no, there was, there was absolute interference here. Capitol building was stormed, huge mess, not so good. Trump can come back and say, well, you contributed to that government. You were the one responsible for it. Mayor Bowser refused my, uh, my help. We were going to send in, I, th I saw a headline today, 10,000 additional National Guard. That was declined. The Sergeant of Arms in the House and the Senate, they were on notice, according to the former chief of police for the Capitol Hill police, that this was going to be a problem. They declined because of optics. The government that's responsible for making sure that the Capitol building is safe and secure, they were negligent. That goes back to causation. Donald Trump didn't cause it. If they prove that he did cause it or they, they make the argument that he is and that led to the interference, he responds back. He says, nope. If the government had been prepared, if they were not negligent, then the interference would not have happened. Okay, it's just sort of like a, a superseding cause. This is the bigger cause, not Trump. Negligence was responsible for what, what we saw happen on January 6th, not the speech. The government was just not prepared. So it's another defense. Now, again, we didn't talk about any of that stuff. Now, if the, if the Democrats can prove all this, if they can follow all the way through the chain and they can convince some senators, some Republican senators that this is really accurate and you know it is egregious, then the Republican senators should vote to convict him. But they won't because they're not going to go through this motion. Today, we talked a lot about, about this. We talked a lot about interference. And we actually really didn't even talk about interference, honestly. They were more talking about something down here that we would just call harm, okay, which was, which was harm. There was a lot. There was a whole different box, a whole harm box. And they were really going from this bad event that happened, a different box over here. So bad was up here. They kind of, you know, uh, uh, tiptoed around jurisdiction, but they were just going directly around here. They were just saying, oh, something bad happened. There's a lot of harm that's taking place, uh, that took place, and uh, Donald Trump's responsible for it, so we're going to impeach the guy. Now, tomorrow we'll see if they are able to connect any of these other dots. I would have preferred that we spent some more time today talking and fleshing out some of these issues, but it was a disappointing day from both uh, both sides, honestly. You know, uh, Raskin was talking about a lot of emotional stuff, a lot of frothy appeals to emotion, a lot of, you know, video montages of stuff getting blown up and then, you know, buildings getting demolished and all of that stuff. Got it. We got it. There was harm. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about jurisdiction. And then tomorrow, we're expecting them to connect the dots. And it doesn't have to be this way. Many other ways that you can go about this. But... You want to see some due process. You want to see that chain connected. Now, our first clip, we only have two. I've got one from uh, the Democrats and we've got one from the Republicans. Largely, this was an, un an uninteresting day, in my opinion. Uh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a real lawyer, actually, and this was like brutal to watch for me. I was, I was flipping through it. When Trump's first attorney came on, Castor, I was like pulling my hair out. I have no idea what he was talking about for 45 minutes. I had to turn it off. Uh, what is he talking about? Uh, and I think that it was probably a strategic thing to just waste time at that point. I, I really can't explain it any way else. But, uh, but that was kind of the tone for the entirety of the day, just kind of like what what are these people doing? Not even interesting, not even good arguments, just a disappointment across the board. Uh, we do have a, some semblance of a substantive argument from this guy. His name is Joe Negussi, I think is how you say it, over from Colorado. Let's listen in on what he had to say on the Senate floor today. Dollar that I know some of you know and, and some of you have actually spoken with recently. Up until just a few weeks ago, he was a recognized champion champion of the view that the Constitution authorizes the impeachment of former officials. And that is Professor Jonathan Turley. Let me show you what I mean. 
These are his words. First, in a very detailed study, thorough study, he explained that, quote, the resignation from office does not prevent trial on articles of impeachment. That's Professor Turley's words. Same piece. He celebrated the Belknap trial. He described it as a corrective measure that helped the system regain legitimacy. He wrote another article. He's written several on this topic. This one is actually it's a 146-page study, very detailed. And in that study, he said, quote, that the decision in Belknap was correct in its view that impeachment historically had extended to former officials, such as Warren Hastings, who you heard lead manager Raskin describe. In fact, as you can see, Professor Turley argued that the House could have impeached and the Senate could have tried Richard Nixon after he resigned. His quote on this, very telling, quote, future presidents could not assume that mere resignation would avoid a trial of their conduct in the United States Senate. Finally, last quote from Professor Turley, that no man in no circumstance can escape the account which he owes to the laws of his country. Not my words, not lead manager Raskin's words, Professor Jonathan Turley's words. I agree with him because he's exactly right. All right, well, he doesn't really agree with you. So uh, Jonathan Turley is somebody that we, he kind of does agree with him, but it's a little bit more complicated than those little uh, uh, quotes that he pulled out of context there. And Jonathan Turley responded on Twitter. Jonathan Turley is somebody that we follow. I, I've, I've uh, talked about him in some of his uh, scholarship on the impeachment articles. Brilliant guy, writes a ton, a ton. Very familiar with the history of the country, especially as it comes to political issues. And so he posted right on Twitter, soon as uh, Rep. John uh, Joe Negussi uh, uh, said that on the floor, he said, well, Rep. Negussi just cited my Duke piece and said that I was an advocate until just a couple weeks ago for retroactive trials. I appreciate the citations, but it is not true. That article was 21 years ago. He says the issue on such close questions remains your default on such questions. I have certainly become more textual in the last three decades, which I have written about over the years. However, this was not a recent change as suggested by Joe. Uh, Negussi just used a quote that uh, that from Blount that is highly contested. First, as I have discussed, there was the question of whether a legislative official could be tried for impeachment. However, Negussi is citing Blount's line that he would never argue that a person can avoid accountability by resigning. Joseph Story and others did not believe that a former official could be held accountable in an impeachment trial. They did not rule out other accountability. So uh, basically what he's saying here is, yes, he said that. He did say that 21 years ago, and it's still relevant. He actually still agrees with it, but he's adding some more meat around the bones. Back then, he was sort of talking about this in the context of, well, impeachment can be useful in those other situations where there are no other remedies that are available. When you don't have a Justice Department who can go and criminally charge a president or a former senator or whomever is being impeached. And so, uh, you know, amazingly, Jonathan Turley already writ wrote a, a response based on what he heard today on the Senate floor. And here is what he says. My recent position of 21 years ago, House Democrats cite a 1992 Duke article in support of impeachment. He said, recently I wrote about how Lawrence Tribe bizarrely claimed that not long ago I argued in favor of retroactive trials. Now House managers have claims that I supported those up to a few weeks ago. Rep. Joe Negussi cited my Duke piece at length to support the basis for retroactive trials after saying that I supported such trials until a few weeks. I felt he did an excellent job in his argument, but that statement is simply not true. His reliance, however, on the Duke article is not misplaced. I did and continue to recognize the value of such trials and certainly the historical use of such trials. It is only his characterization of my position that was misleading. Indeed, if my views of 21 years ago are going to be cited as recent, please use my photo from the 90s. I was thinner then. To give you an idea of how recent this was, here's a picture of when I wrote it, right? So that's him. So he's kind of having fun with this. He's being very uh, deferential. He's being very... Uh, you know, he's, he's being a gentleman about it. Indeed, as scholars, we are ideally always evolving our knowledge and our views. However, I still believe the retroactive active trials question that they have dialogic value. And this remains a close question. My default today is more textualist on the question. And so he's not answer, he's not really uh, getting to this. But if you click that link, it will take you to this article. And he says the case against 
retroactive impeachment trials, a response to the open letter of the scholars. A lot of other people endorsed the constitutional basis for trying President Trump, but the letter contains many individuals I know and respect. However, people of good faith can disagree, and I would like to respond and offer a countervailing view. So I'm not going to go through this entire article. He wrote it on January 29th. You can go check that out. It's a good one, and uh, I actually agree with it. Well, if we go back to the original article, uh, so this one where he was responding to, to what happened today, he said, while only briefly addressed in my past writings, my view of this threshold issue has continued to evolve over the last 30 years. I found over these decades that departures from language of the Constitution have produced greater dangers and costs. I've become more textualist in that sense, but I'm neither an originalist nor a strict textualist. I have discussed the trend in my writings over the last three years. If I were to write this piece today, I would still maintain that it shows how impeachment trials serve this dialogic role, but that of the three outlying cases, I agree with the decision in Blount and roughly half the Senate in Belknap that such trials are extra constitutional. So he's saying, you know, back then these were these these had value. It was good to talk about these things, but they were not constitutional back then. It was historically allowed, but I believe that it is not constitutionally sound. That view against retro retroactive impeachments is strengthened by what we have witnessed in the two Trump impeachment. Thus, I don't fault I don't fault reliance of the Duke piece by House managers to support how they value retroactive trials and the historical defense of such trials. I still believe that. However, my textual views did not recently change. They have changed almost almost three decades. I've been criticized for my greater reliance on the text in such interpretation. So you understand what Joe Negussi was trying to do, right? He was trying to pick sort of this right wing constitutional lawyer, cite one of his articles and then make the claim, hey, look, even your own guy agrees that this thing's constitutional. So why don't you? And it's, you know, it's a good argument. It's, it's uh, a little bit disingenuous, but you know, he may not have known the nuances of this, right? He, may, he was probably, him and his researchers were just looking for, you know, they were, they were looking for what they wanted and they found it and they used it. Now, Jonathan Turley just got on Twitter and said, no, that's not exactly right. You know, I still don't think retroactive trials are constitutional. I did say 21 years ago that there was some value to them for having conversations about it back during that other era, but not so much anymore, right? So that was his point, counterpoint. Then we we're going to get over to Donald Trump's attorney. So as I mentioned, the, uh, his first attorney, I don't know what the heck he was doing. He was out there. He was like talking for 45 minutes and I could not even follow him. Uh, to me, it sounded like he was stalling. I think his defense team, as we read in the rules, they both got two hours to have a conversation and I think they just split it right down the middle. David Scone is the second attorney who came out and he actually also had some legal arguments, which are good. That's what we wanted to focus on. Uh, but the first attorney, Castor, I don't know, like I said, I don't know what he was talking about. About senators being good people, on and on and on. So we're just going to skip right over that. Here is David Scone. So this is Trump's second attorney. This guy, uh, people, I, I think we're we're making fun of him on Twitter because when he was drinking a sip of water, he was covering his head when he was drinking it. He's going back like that. People are like, well, what, what does he have a hole in his head? Is the water going to come out back? What's going on? <laughs> well, he's got a yarmulke, right? I think that's the, that's the thing. He's got a yarmulke on his head or he's used to having a yarmulke on his head. And so he just typically will, you know, will do that when he drinks just because it's there, you know, want your yarmulke to fall off. Uh, so, you know, everybody on both sides today is just waiting for anything that they can grasp on. And uh, it's kind of embarrassing, but all right. So that's that. Here is David Scone. Uh, today, and he's talking about something called a stipulation, which I'm going to explain. They want to put you through a 16-hour presentation over two days, focusing on this as if it were some sort of blood sport. And to what end? For healing? For unity? For accountability? Not for any of those. For they surely there are much better ways to achieve each. It is again for pure, raw, misguided partisanship that makes them believe playing to our worst instincts somehow is good. They don't need to show you movies to show you that the riot happened here. We will stipulate that it happened, and you know all about it. This is a process fueled irresponsibly by base hatred by these House managers and those who gave them their charge, and they are willing to sacrifice our national character to advance their hatred and their fear that one day, 
They might not be the party in power. They have a very different view of democracy and freedom from Justice Jackson. All right, so what he's talking about there is what's called a stipulation. And this is something that happens a lot in criminal law. Stipulation basically means that both sides are agreeing to something. And the example that I was thinking of is in a DUI case. And uh, this is something that sneaky prosecutors can do, especially if you are a new uh, criminal defense attorney, be cognizant of this. If you're a defense attorney, be cognizant of this. If you're a prosecutor, don't do this. It's not cool. You're going to anyways, though. This, this, this happens. Let's say you're in a DUI trial, you're representing a client, and your client is a, let's say, a, a college student, female, who gets emotional, okay, when she gets stopped by the police. All right. So she's pulled over for allegedly drinking and driving. Now you are, you've gone through the case, you've been working on it for months, and you're on the day of trial. You go to trial, and you're having your arguments in front of the judge. You do your opening arguments, and the, the, the prosecution is presenting their case. And one of the elements that they have to prove, of course, they got to show that your client was you know, driving a car, right? And whether actual physical control or whether the car is in motion, you got to be driving. You got to get, if you're going to get a DUI, you got to be driving the car. You also got to be under the influence of something. You got to be impaired to the slightest degree. Your blood alcohol content has to be over the legal limit. There are certain elements, depending on your state, that they got to meet. But they also got to prove to the court that the person who was driving the car was in fact your client, right? Identification. They got to make that connection. And it may seem so obvious to you. You may just go, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, if she's sitting in court and, you know, you know, she knows she got the ticket and we're all there, okay, fine. But it, it can get a little bit more complicated than that. You know, they have to prove that it is your client. And so what often happens is the parties will stipulate to identification, Okay, so the government will say, well, and, and officer, isn't it true that uh, the person you stopped and cited is sitting right there in court? And, go, and the officer will look at him and go, yep, that's her. That's who I stopped six months ago. Okay, that's one way that they can prove identification. Sometimes that happens. That's not sneaky. What some prosecutors will do is they'll say, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, officer. And uh, I also want to show you this picture. And I, wanna, uh, you, I know you've identified them. But I want to show you this picture that we took or that you took right there on the side of the road. Okay, just to make sure that it's the same person. And what they'll do is they'll show that photograph to the officer. They'll show it to the defense. If you don't catch this, you know, you, you could object to that photograph. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. You could object to that. And you could say, nope, we don't need that, Your Honor. We're going to stipulate to ID. We're going to just agree that we don't need the jury to see that photo. We don't need that admitted as an exhibit. We agree that what the officer just said about our client is accurate. The reason why they want to get that photograph in is because your very emotional 22-year-old college student, guy or girl, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? If they're very emotional, they're going to be crying on the side. They're going to have mascara falling down their face. Their eyes are going to be swollen and puffy and bloodshot, uh, whether they're drunk or not, right? If you're, if you're driving and you're pulled over and you're hysterical on the side of the road, you're going to look drunk in a photograph. You're going to look terrible. And the prosecutor wants to get that in in order to make your client look bad. It's evidence, right? It's going to, well, we're going to mark this as an exhibit. Uh, just to show officer, right, that's her. And so they're going to try to get it in on an identification basis. And unless you object to that, that document might come in and sit in front of the jury. And it's only for identity. But if you are a criminal defense attorney, you object to that. You say, judge, look, we're going to stipulate to that. We're going to agree. We don't even need to fight over it. We acknowledge that identity is proven. Okay, both sides agree. You don't have to fight over that stuff. That's what would be good. Now, if a prosecutor gets that in, now a jury that was originally looking at your client sitting there with, you know, with nice makeup, nice clothes, ready for a trial, looking presentable, they look at her and they go, yeah, she looks drunk. She looks bad. She looks like a hysterical mess. We're going to punish her. And a defense argument would be, no, Your Honor, that provides no value to the determination about the person's identity. We already agree it's her. The jury seeing that photograph would just be way more prejudicial against our client than it would be probative. It's not going to add any value. It's just going to do more harm, right? And so the judge, typically, depending on the judge, will say, yeah, nice try, prosecutor. Good job. But we're just going to let, uh, we're, we're, we're going to just accept that stipulation and everything's going to move forward.
without that photograph being admitted. So it's a stipulation. It's the same thing that David Scone was just talking about. And to go back to our flow chart, he is saying, yes, listen, we're going to stipulate to all of this. We're going to stipulate that there was massive amounts of interference. We get it. We'll even stipulate that they stormed the Capitol. All of this was harmful. Okay. We will agree with you 100%. They were breaking things. They were trying to steal the podium. They had their feet on Nancy Pelosi's desk. We got it. Okay, we'll agree to all this. We don't need videos. We don't need photographs. We don't need long, uh, you know, sort of winded statements about how traumatic this was for you. We all got it. We don't need that submitted as evidence. What we do need is to show all of these other chain links were connected. And we haven't gotten there yet. We have a couple more days. We'll see if we do. And so uh, he's just basically saying enough, enough already, right? They were only talking about jurisdiction or supposed to be, and it really didn't turn into that. So as we know, this is what the final vote count looked like as to the question of whether former president Donald Trump is subject to the jurisdiction of a court of impeachment for acts committed while president. The everybody it voted uh, 56 voted yes, 44 voted nay. Who voted yes of the Republicans? Well, got six of them. And it's, as I have been calling them lovingly, these squishy Republicans, the ones who are always sort of in the middle. We've got uh, Susan Collins from Maine, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska, Mitt Romney from Utah. We got Cassidy over from Louisiana, Toomey from Pennsylvania, and Sass from Nebraska, who I think will probably be running for uh, president in 2024. And then what do the rules say about tomorrow? Before we change gears, the former president in the House of Representatives shall have until 9 a.m. on Wednesday to file any motions permitted under the rules of impeachment with the exception of motions to subpoena witnesses. So no witnesses are coming in tomorrow or documents or any other evidentiary motions. So I'm not sure what they're going to be filing, but they're filing stuff as long as it's not subpoena witnesses or documents or any other evidentiary motions. Responses to any such motions shall be filed no later than 11 a.m. tomorrow on Wednesday. And then all materials filed pursuant to this section are going to be filed with the secretary, printed and made available to all parties. Arguments on the motions will begin at 12 noon tomorrow, and each side may determine the number of persons to make its presentation, following which the Senate shall deliberate, if so ordered, under the rules of impeachment and vote on any such motion. So tomorrow morning, we're going to see a lot of activity. They're going to be you know, drafting motions, presumably. Everything needs to be uh, submitted early tomorrow. Our response is then due by 11. And then everything in terms of arguments will start at 12 p.m. for another day of the impeachment spectacle.